Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning. It's good to see uh, all of you here. Uh, Jeff is away this morning. He's with the young people at their weekend. And uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, conducting the service this morning. Just draw your attention to uh, some of the announcements for today. You're reminded of tea and coffee following the service, and we would encourage you to stay for that. And then there is the informal service this evening at 7 o'clock in the welcome area, and that will be uh, conducted by Jeff. And then there's a a number of activities uh, again uh, next week. Uh, 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 The Tots and Toddlers, uh, they're planning to meet for the following three Tuesdays, and it will be in uh, Blair Main Wellbeing and Leisure Complex uh, to use the play park from 10 to 11, uh, weather permitting. So you're asked uh, to note that. Uh, and then uh, the uh, Boys Brigade, they're going to be having a uh, prize night uh, on Tuesday evening at 7 um, uh, 15. Uh, that's for the company section, uh, boys. And uh, parents, again, are warmly invited to come along uh, for that uh, occasion. And there will be refreshments served at it. We remind you of the drop-off on Thursday, the 28th of April, from 10 to 12 noon. And that's for uh, church envelopes and for items for the food bank. And again, we would encourage you to give support um, to the food bank. And then we would ask you to note that the small groups are uh, starting again this week, uh, meeting on Wednesday at 7.30 and on Friday at 12.30. Uh, These are uh, informal times when we look at the Bible together and what it has to teach us, and uh, we really could encourage you to come along. They're very beneficial uh, and very um, helpful. And then on uh, Thursday evening, Uh, At uh, 7.30, the men's fellowship uh, group is meeting, and they are to have uh, a film night in the Kerr Hall. And then we would just ask you to note uh, about the PW uh, outing on Saturday the 14th of May. Uh, And again, uh, if you would like to go to that, I'm sure there's a list somewhere, Um, so you'll probably have to sign up to the list uh, for that. So those are all the the announcements. And then we come to the uh, birthday slot um, today. uh, And we have someone whose birthday it is today, and that's uh, Mandy Graham. And then in the incoming week, there is Peter Boyle. Um, His mom was glad that we were able to remind him, uh, remind her of that, that it was tomorrow. Um, Rachel Nugent is this week. Uh, Jamie Moreland uh, is this week, and perhaps the one we want to highlight more than the others, everybody's birthday is important, but uh, John Cumming, uh, who lives in the Man's Road, is going to be 100 uh, this week, and so we send our particular congratulations to him. So let's join together to pray. We pray together. Lord, we thank you that all our days are in your hands. And we thank you that birthdays are special occasions, occasions when we can mark another year. And thank you for all the blessings that we have enjoyed during that year. And we want to pray uh, today for uh, Mandy, Peter, Rachel, and Jamie as they celebrate their birthdays, that it will be an enjoyable family occasion for them all. And we pray in particular for John, who has reached this great uh, milestone of 100 years. We thank you that it's a special day for him, and we ask that he and his family would be able to uh, enjoy it uh, and, and to celebrate it and to give thanks for his long life. So hear us as we offer these, our prayers to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
We're enjoying such wonderful weather at the moment, uh, and our first hymn celebrates the greatness of God shown to us in the beauty of his creation, but of course shown to us supremely in the giving of his. We sing together, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, on hymn 187.
and we join together to pray. Lord, we are mindful in these moments that we are in the presence of greatness. Far greater than the greatest this world has to offer. And in these moments, we want to bow the knee before you, to acknowledge you as King. And yet to remember that you are the king who left his throne and came and shared our lives out of love for each one of us. We are amazed that the one who enjoyed the highest place in heaven and earth Aim to take the lowest place as he bled on a cross for us and for our forgiveness. And we realize that love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my life. And as we bring our gifts to you today, as tokens of our gratitude, we want to offer ourselves wholly to you. In Jesus' name. Okay, boys and girls, would you like to come to the front? I know there's not too many of you this morning, but run up quick and come to the front so that I can see you. Yes. Oh, somebody's running hard. Brilliant. Okay, good van. Now, there are only five of you this morning, but you're the... You're the five best that there is. So that's really good. Here is something that I I like doing. I wonder if you like doing these. What is it? It's a jigsaw puzzle. Do you like doing jigsaws? Some of you do, some of you don't. This is a thousand piece one. I like doing jigsaw puzzles. Here we go. I'm going to show you a picture. Look, imagine a box full of pieces like that, and then it becomes like that. That's a jigsaw that I did. Took me forever doing it. It's very, very hard. Here's another one that I did. That was even harder. All those plants and green bits, really hard to put them together. Jigsaw puzzles are very great fun, but they can be very difficult. Even when you have a pattern, even when you know what uh, you're supposed to be doing, it can be really, really difficult to put them together. Now, this is is a, a jigsaw puzzle that I got for Christmas. And as you see, I haven't opened it yet because I like doing jigsaws during the winter, but not in the summer because there's too many good nights, long nights, and you like to get out playing. But this is a very special jigsaw, because there are two jigsaws in this box. There's this jigsaw here that you're given a pattern for, but there's another jigsaw. And it's, it's, you have to guess what it might be like sitting there and seeing what the scene would be like across the way. Now, I'm, I'm really scared to do it because how will I know what it's like? How will I know when I'm getting the right pieces in the right place? 
It's going to be very difficult. It will probably take me all winter. But I'm looking forward to it, even if it's a bit scary. But here's the thing, boys and girls. When Jesus rose from the dead, it was very difficult for his disciples to understand what was going on. This is a picture about a story in the Bible called about two disciples who were walking on the road to a mess. They were heading home after Jesus had been crucified. And they had heard stories that his tomb was empty and maybe he might be alive, but it didn't seem to make sense to them. They thought to themselves, how could that be true? And it was a puzzle, a puzzle. They couldn't put it all together. They couldn't understand it. And then someone came alongside them and began to talk to them and began to explain to them what was happening and why Jesus had to die and why he had rose, had risen from the grave. This person was able to put all the bits of the jigsaw together for them. And of course, we now know that that person was Jesus. He was able to explain to them all that was happening. And you know, boys and girls, sometimes life and, 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 and what we're facing in life is a bit like the jigsaw. There's so many different pieces, and, and we don't know how to put them together. We, we don't know how to, how to work out, you know, what, 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 what's happening in our lives and, and what the meaning of it is and, and where God fits in. God has given us his word to help us to understand. But more than that, he has given us himself. And so he encourages us. Here's a very famous uh, verse in the Bible. He encourages us to trust Jesus. And to do it with all our hearts. And then he says, don't lean on your own understanding. When you can't things up, don't worry about it. Trust in Jesus. Keep doing what he says. In other words, he'll put pieces together that you will be able to get the best possible. Remind remember that. And to remember these verses in particular. Would you like to say them together? We'll say them together after one, two, Just in the word with your heart. Lean on your own. Understanding in all ways, acknowledging He will meet your paths straight. You'll learn to do that, boys and girls. I know it's not easy to do because I try to do it and I don't find it easy and, and I don't sometimes understand how, how all the bits fit together and how God is working. But I've got to trust in Him. Not lean on my own understanding. Do what he says, and he will make the path straight. Okay, we're going to sing your hymn now. Uh, and it's, uh, it's on the video, so we're going to ask you to stand. Uh, I'm going to ask the congregation to stand. Uh, 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 and it's, it's a great uh, little uh, song. It's all about Jesus being the king of men. And because he's king, we can trust him. And when we're trusting him, he will lead us in the right way. So let's stand for King Charles. You can go to Sunday school now. Uh, we come to our uh, prayers of intercession and we... 
uh, once pray as we have been doing for the situation in Ukraine and for all the efforts that are being made to resolve that conflict. I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware, um, but today is the final day of uh, the ministry of, of the Reverend William Sinclair. You, you all know William well. He is retiring um, from his congregation today. And so we want to pray for him and Alison uh, and the family uh, on this special occasion. So with these thoughts, we turn together to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so conscious we live in a world that is torn by sin and suffering and death. We can hardly take it in, man's inhumanity to man. The terrible things that we do to one another. And we're being made aware of that continually on our TV screens. When we think of the conflict that is taking place in the Ukraine. And we want to pray for all who are seeking to bring a resolution to that conflict. We are praying for the leaders of Russia, for a change of heart, for a willingness to seek the ways of peace and to set aside the ways of war. And we pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for the many elderly people left behind in cities ravaged by bombs, sheltering underground with little or no heat and little or no food or water. We pray for the many who have lost loved ones, for the many who have been injured, and for the millions who have been displaced from their homes. Lord, we pray for all who are seeking to help in this situation, for all who are seeking to bring support and comfort in every way possible. We acknowledge that you are king over this world. We pray for an end to this conflict. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the ministry of the Reverend William Sinclair. We know that many in this congregation have benefited from that ministry. And remember him fondly. We pray for uh, William and Alison and the family as today marks his final day of ministry before retirement. We ask that this would be uh, an enjoyable day for William, a day of celebration, remembering all that God has done uh, through him, and a day of thanksgiving for God's work in his life, in the life of this congregation and in the congregation in Ballymena. We ask for your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name. And finally, our God, we remember the Young People's Weekend. We thank you for the lovely weather that they have enjoyed, for all the activities in which they have been engaged But we pray especially for them spiritually, that in these young years, that they would grasp the truth of your word and that they would embrace Jesus for themselves. As that weekend comes to an end, 
just continue to put your hand upon the leaders and all the young people. And may there be great rejoicing in heaven and great rejoicing in this congregation when we hear all that you have done. Through that we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We read together from God's Word, and our reading this uh, this morning is going to be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading firstly from verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. This gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brethren at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, Then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. And then jumping over to verse 12, and and, and Paul begins to unpack for us um, the meaning or the implication of the resurrection. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. And we finish our reading at verse 19. Before we consider these verses, we are going to turn and praise God once again, singing that lovely hymn, hymn 389, Come and See.
I want to think this morning about the question, why the resurrection? Why is it so important? Surely people would be more likely to believe the, the message of Christianity if there was no resurrection. After all, we all know dead people don't rise. And it's not only in our day that people are saying such things, but they were saying exactly the same things in the days of the Apostle Paul. We don't need the resurrection. Let's do away with it. And, and in our passage, Paul outlines for us the essence of the Christian message. And he reminds us that this wasn't a message that he had created, but it was a message that he had received from the Lord Jesus himself. And what was that message? What's the essence of the gospel? Paul puts it this way. Christ died according to the scriptures for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day from the grave. And so, why is the resurrection so important? Michael Parkinson is perhaps best known uh, as the king of interviewers when it comes uh, to British TV. Uh, and, and he has interviewed scores of, of famous people over the years. One Easter time, many years ago, he uh, interviewed the former Archbishop of uh, Canterbury, Lord Runsey. Uh, and he put to Runsey this question about the importance of the resurrection. And Runcie said this to him. He said, no resurrection, no Christianity. And in saying that, Runcie was simply following the teaching of Paul in the reading that we've just had. For Paul tells us in that reading, if there's no resurrection, then he says, our preaching my preaching is useless. Our faith, your faith, is futile. And that we are to be pitied more than all other people in the world. Now, today I'm, I'm not looking at the evidence for the resurrection. We, we could spend a whole sermon on that. The essential evidence for the resurrection is the empty tomb, the post-resurrection appearances that Paul outlined for us in our passage, the change in the disciples, and the birth of the church. And there are many who have set out to disprove the resurrection, but when they have looked honestly at, at the evidence for it, have been forced almost against their will to embrace it. But this morning we're asking, why is the resurrection so central? Well, here's the reason. Oh, 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 we go. The first thing is this. Are we not working? Yeah, put it up for me. The first thing is this, that the resurrection confirms the identity of Jesus. No one could deny the central place that Jesus has played in the history of the world in the last two centuries. Some of the greatest prose that has been, has been written about. The Bible continues year in and year out to be the best-selling book it's his story. Some of the greatest works of art depict scenes from his life. 
we can think of, 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 of Da Vinci's great painting of, of the Last Supper. And we could name many, many more. Some of the most acclaimed pieces of music have been written in celebration of him. We think of the wonderful hymns that we sing in church. We think of something like Handel's Messiah. And some of the most magnificent buildings in our world were constructed to honor him. Think of two that I have visited. St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or Cologne Cathedral in, in, in Germany. And, and we need to ask, if, if Jesus plays uh, such a, a central part in history, why is there all this interest in him? And the reason for it is what he said about himself. He said that he wasn't just man, but that he was also God. Fully human, fully divine, two natures in one person. And everything about his life was consistent with that claim. I mean, he lived in the way we would have expected God to live. Those who knew him the best, his, his disciples who were Jews, who thought that only God was sinless, could say of Jesus he was without sin. He taught the things we would expect God to teach. All who heard him said he taught with authority. He acted in the way we would expect God to act. He gave people their sins. He accepted their worship, the worship that would only be reserved for God. And he did the things that we, ex we would have expected God to do. He performed all those amazing miracles. But if his body had rotted in the grave, how could we ever be sure he was all he claimed to be? The resurrection is the crowning piece of evidence. He rose from the grave. It confirms his identity. Paul, in, in the opening verses of, of the book of Romans, reminds us of Jesus' human descent. He was a descendant of David. But then he goes on to say that he was declared the Son of God by the resurrection. Why is this so important? Well, if Jesus is God, as we believe he is, and as the resurrection proves, then when it comes to the matters of God and ourselves and, our, uh, and life, surely we need to listen to his voice. He alone can give us the truth about all of these matters. Now, we live in a society and in a world that has rejected absolute truth. All truth is relative. And so people say, you have your truth, and it's okay for you to believe it. I have my truth, and it's okay for me to believe it, even if the two truths contradict each other. They're supposed to be regarded as equally valid. But the resurrection proves that Jesus is God and that he alone speaks the truth. And if we want to know about God, if we want to know about ourselves, if we want to know about life and who we are and why we're here, then it's Jesus that we need to listen to. 
And the other, another implication is simply this, that Jesus is the only one who can lead us to God. And again, this is part of the, the world rejecting absolute truth. What is it people say? All the religions of the world are just different paths to the same God. And it sounds so nice, but it's absolute nonsense. If you listen to the teachings of each of the religions of the world, they are very different. And they have very different opinions about what God is like. Hinduism, they don't have God. Jesus rose from the dead. And he alone is the only one who can lead us to God. And so the resurrection confirms the identity of Jesus. Secondly, the resurrection shows his sacrifice was acceptable to God. There is something that most of us carry within us. And that is a sense of shame and guilt over things that we have done in the past. We have a conscience and we instinctively know that there are some things that are wrong. And when we go against that conscience, these negative feelings of guilt and regret arise within us. And if they're not dealt with, we can carry them with us through the years. And they can be like a burden on our backs, weighing us down and even affecting our health. Uh, several years ago, there was a, a, an article in the Belfast Telegraph. It, it concerned a, a man. Uh, as a young boy, he, 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 was, he was only in his teens. He fired a shot into the home uh, of two other young boys. Uh, they were in the living room, but no one was hurt. And, and, and nobody had a clue who fired the shot. And for 20 years, that young boy carried that guilt on his back. And 20 years later, he walked into the police station and he confessed his crime. And he said this, two nights, the two nights I was in custody were the best night's sleep that I have had in a very long time. Now, I'm sure none of us here have broken any laws. But we have said and, and done things that have hurt other people. We have acted foolishly in our lives that, that has done harm to ourselves you know, maybe we've made a mess of, of life in some way. And, and we, how, how do we deal with that shame and with that guilt? Where do we find forgiveness? Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for all our wrongdoing. He was the perfect man. He was without sin. And it was for that reason he could be our representative on the cross. But he was also God. And our sin was against God. And only God could pay the price for our sin. And so Jesus, the God-man, took upon himself the punishment that our sin deserved. The Apostle Paul puts it even more bluntly. He said, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. But if Jesus' body had rotted in the grave, how would we ever have known that his sacrifice was acceptable to God. 
the resurrection is the proof that it is. And what good news that is for each one of us. There is forgiveness to be found in Jesus. He bore our shame and guilt so that we need not bear it for ourselves. Kira Knightley is a, is a, is a very famous uh, film star. Uh, and on one occasion she was uh, heard to say, well, life must be very easy for Christians. They, they, they can just ask for forgiveness. Uh, 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 and, and that's all they have to do. But all of us know that it's not easy to ask for forgiveness. For to receive Jesus' forgiveness involves repentance. And repentance means facing up to what we have done, admitting it to ourselves and to, and to God turning away from it and turning to him. And it also involves restitution. If we have hurt another, if we have cheated another, then we go to them. And as a sign of our repentance, we seek to restore the relationship with them by apologizing or by returning what we have taken from them. But the resurrection affirms that Jesus' sacrifice was acceptable to God. And you and I can stand before God and other people with a clear conscience not on the basis of what we've done, but simply on the basis of what Christ has done for us. Are you carrying a burden on your back of shame and guilt? Something that has happened in the past? Something that you actually can't undo? Be ready to go to Jesus and repent can be forgiveness for you. And thirdly, and lastly, and very quickly, um, the resurrection demonstrates Jesus' power over death. A few Easter's ago, there was a, a very interesting article in one of the uh, national newspapers. It concerned a, a group uh, of uh, young lecturers. I think it was Oxford University. Many of them had signed up to have their bodies or parts of their bodies preserved, uh, you know, in deep freeze. Cryogenics is, or cryogenics is, is what we, we call it. And the reason that they had, had done this was their belief that given sufficient time, humanity would find the answer to death. I want to suggest to you this morning that, that it was a mistaken uh, belief. For they consider death to be a biological problem to be solved. Whereas the Bible teaches us that death is a moral problem that we can't solve. Famous verse, the wages of sin is death. And death is our last and greatest enemy. It, 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 it fills us with uncertainty. It fills us with, with fear. It can be extremely painful. It, it is that separating and dividing what God had united, the separating of body and spirit. But the resurrection 
shows that Jesus has destroyed our final enemy. Uh, when I conduct a funeral service, I, I often use this particular illustration. Back in the Middle Ages, sailors from uh, Europe believed that there was a, um, a, 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 a trip or, 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 or a way round the tip of Africa into the spice-bearing countries of the East. Many attempts had been made to round uh, the tip, but they all ended in disaster. They named the Cape the Cape of Storms. And then another sailor made the effort to round the Cape. He was successful, and he made it to the spice-bearing countries of the East. There's actually a statue uh, uh, to him in Singapore Harbor. His name is Vasco da Gama. And when he returned to his home port of Lisbon, there was no doubting there was a way round the tip of Africa to the East. They actually changed the name of the Cape. They changed the name from the Cape of Storms to the Cape of Good Hope. And without Jesus, death is for us a Cape of Storms. It's full of worry and fear. But Jesus has transformed it into a Cape of Good Hope. For all who trust in him, it is the doorway into life in all its fullness in the presence of God forevermore. When it comes to death and what lies beyond, only Jesus speaks with authority about this matter because only Jesus has come. And you know the old illustration taken from the words of the Bible that there are two paths in life. One path leads to God. The other path leads away from God to eternal judgment. And what's the difference between the people who walk on the different paths? Are the people on the broad road in some way not as good or as moral as the people on the narrow road? And of course the answer is no. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The difference is that people on the narrow road are not trusting in themselves but are trusting in Jesus their forgiveness and for their salvation. And so here is the importance of the resurrection. It confirms the identity of Jesus. It shows that his sacrifice was acceptable to God and it demonstrates his power over death. And what's the implication for our everyday lives? Well, there are two things that often spoil our enjoyment of life. The one is guilt concerning our past. The other is fear of the future. The resurrection shows that Jesus has dealt with such things. And so as we are about to sing in our closing hymn, when we are trusting in him, we can say, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. What a hope that is. And it can be your hope you're ready to turn 
away from self and turn to Jesus in repentance and in faith. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you today that we don't serve a dead hero, but that we worship a risen Lord. We thank you today that we believe that you are here in our midst and that you have the power to forgive our sin, that you promise us victory over death as we trust in you and you tell us that as we look to you day by day that you will be with us to lead us. What a hope you offer us. May each of us know that hope for ourselves because we ask it in your name. And so we close our service with that great hymn that brings together, in a sense, all the things that I have been uh, talking about. In Christ alone, my hope is found. blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore.
And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father who loved us, the Son who gave his life for us, and the Spirit who gives us new life, eternal life, be with us all. Amen. Ian reminds you to stay for tea and coffee in the welcome area.